Okay, so we're live there now. So, Jigweave Galera Cordia to on all his arm by Libshan Anu. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, bienvenue. Welcome to our Halloween event tonight. It's great to be here with you all. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation, whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon today. I know our viewers this evening are joining from many places near and far, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of these lands too. So some of you may have tuned in to our event on Tuesday that we hosted with our colleagues in the Consulate General of New York, or some of you might have attended our Halloween event in person last year, so you might be familiar with tonight's special guest. And if you are, if you aren't, either way, you're still in for a big treat. So Julie, a very special welcome to you tonight. We're delighted to have you here with us. So for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Julie has a PhD in folklore from Memorial University in Newfoundland. She's got an MPhil in medieval history from Trinity College Dublin. She also has taken cultural management courses at the École des Hautes Etudes Commerciales in Montreal and is an accredited strategic performance management specialist from Rutgers University in New Jersey. In addition to holding policy, research and parliamentary affairs roles, she's currently a senior analyst within the Government of Canada, working on indigenous and human rights issues and and is also a part-time professor of Celtic studies at the University of Ottawa. It's basically, we couldn't ask for a better person to teach us more about Ireland as the hashtag home of Halloween, as we like to say. So this will be a QA and a style fireside chat. So you'll see here, I have um, rearranged my whole house to have this fake fireplace behind me. Thank you, Netflix, for this video. Um, so, uh, you know, I will be uh, posing questions to Julie as we go along, and, uh, but we also want to hear from you, our viewers. So if you're watching there on YouTube, if you're looking on a laptop, as you look at your screen, you see a little box to the right of the video. You can type in there, say hello to us, let us know where you're tuning in from. If you have any questions, comments, anything you'd like me to post to Julie, just fire them in there. If you're on a phone or I think also a tablet, the box to make your comments is underneath the video. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you, so don't be shy. Although judging by our last few videos, I don't think there's any shy people in our audiences anymore. So feel free to hit us up with your questions and I'll try to get as many of them as possible. But before we start though, and without further ado, I'll hand over to the new Ambassador of Ireland to Canada, Eamon McKee, to kick off tonight's event. So welcome, Ambassador. Well, welcome to the dark side. But don't worry, we're in very good hands with Julie LeBanc, our expert on Halloween. Thanks for the introduction, Laura, too. You know, Halloween is a special time of year. Uh, Ireland's been occupied for 5,000 years. And we know because they built big megalithic tombs that they were very conscious of the kind of liminal moments of the year when the sun changed its orientation. Famously, of course, Newgrange uh, that captures the winter solstice. Uh, but there's other, other grave passage graves uh, that capture other part, parts of the year. There's some point at which agricultural society displaces those major, major moments for what are known as the quarter days. That is the days in between these big moments of the solstice and the equinox. And that it's on one of those quarter days that Halloween occurs. And because of that, Halloween is seen to be a liminal moment, a movement between light and dark when winter is coming. And of course in winter, the sun is weak, but so are we and the spirits the dead, the spirit world are seen to be much, much stronger. So Halloween, in a way, is a preparation for that more dangerous time of the year. There's no growth in the soil. Uh, the sun is weak. It is cold. Food supplies will run low and the spirits are nearby. And so to protect ourselves in a way to manage this uh, period, uh, we dress up. There's trick or treating. In a way, we try to uh, give physical form to the spirits so that we can control them or we can pay our way through trick or treating uh, so that evil doesn't come to us or we can even predict the future if we use certain rites and rituals. Uh, bonfires are really important at this time of year as they are at those other liminal moments because a bonfire is a symbol of hope, of warmth and of light and they're very important as, as signals around the community that we're all uh, in this together. Um, there's a great tradition uh, deep in Irish folklore um, of spirits. Uh, we all know about the leprechaun, but there's, there's the puka. Uh, my own personal uh, uh, favorite, if I can put it that way, the banshee, which is, which is very, very scary. I'll never forget uh, the first time I saw Darby O'Gill and the little people and the banshee came up. Uh, it still lives with me. Um, so in a way, we kind of deliberately scare ourselves around Halloween, um, but it speaks to something, I think, uh, deep, in our nature. 
Um, it's also one of those festivals that in a way has resisted Christianization. Um, the Christian missionaries successfully, I think, uh, colonized Christmas uh, and Easter, um, but weren't really that successful in colonizing Halloween. You know, they tried it with, with um, the old Hallow's Eve and so on, but Halloween retains in many ways its pagan power, which is quite fascinating. Um, and not only was it a powerful festival in the past, it's a powerful festival today. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that um, the Irish brought Halloween um, to the United States with them in that major movement of emigration after the famine in the second half of the 19th century. Um, and of course, when it was in America, Halloween then uh, becomes enriched. Uh, Hollywood takes it, um, it's more or less on steroids. And we suddenly have this global phenomena where new characters enter uh, from the horror genre. And, and Halloween goes back to Ireland um, and, and we adopt many of those characters. One of the new characters, interestingly, that joins Halloween is Dracula, a vampire. And of course, Dracula was written by an Irish writer, uh, Bram Stoker. So the, the roots of Halloween are very much in Ireland. Uh, it's, a, it's a special, scary, intriguing, and very alluring time. Um, when you put on a mask, um, you do change. Uh, you can adopt a different personality. Um, and this occasion in the year is something that, that runs through most societies. Uh, we know it from the Roman period, we know it from Asian societies, and, and we now have it, of course, in the West with, with, with the costuming around, around Halloween. So I'm delighted to be part of this and uh, really looking forward to a continuation of a discussion we began earlier this week uh, with, with Julie, as I say, our expert on Halloween. Um, and I hope you in, in, enjoy this session and it adds to your appreciation of a very special time of the year and a very special Irish festival. So um, thank you for tuning in. Look forward to your questions and back to you, Laura. Sorry, thanks very much for that, Ambassador. So over to you now, Julie. Another great Julie taught us that we should start at the beginning because it's a very good place to start. So can you speak to the early roots of Halloween and the Samhain festival, please? Um, so basically, we're going to have to go back more than 2000 years ago uh, with the uh, ancient Celts. So we're really going to be looking at it from a pan-Celtic perspective. When we look at the Celtic nations, we're thinking of not just Ireland, of Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Brittany, and the Isle of Man, and Wales. And throughout all of these, um, these, these, these different groups, uh, there had been a common thread that was actually celebrated, which was based on recognizing these, these harvest festivals um, that were promoted largely through those that kept or that were the keepers of knowledge and of traditions and those famous Druids. Um, so over 2000 years ago, the Druidic castes were the ones that were actually recognizing specific times in the year that we needed to uh, enact rituals and Samhain, um, which is our Halloween today, was one of the major feast days. Um, so, on November 1st, we actually do celebrate Samhain itself, but our Halloween, which is more the All Hallows Eve, which is an old English uh, term to say the, the Eve of the Hallows of the, the Day of the Dead, uh, we start celebrating some of the, the events that will lead on to a few days and in some cases might actually last more than a, a week. Um, with the the the, the um, evidence basically that we have as to how these particular groups had celebrated um, Samhain uh, throughout um, the, the different uh, Celtic nations, like in, in Wales, it would be uh, uh, Galangwaive or uh, the Isle of Man, it would be Samhain and same thing Samhain in Scotland with uh, the Bretons, Gwela um, The famous Knights of Samhain in Ireland, the Icha Sauna, uh, would have been um, talked about at least through an old calendar, which takes its name from where it was found uh, 2000 years ago in Coligny in France, so in Eastern France. And it's this bronze um, um, calendar. It looks uh, basically it's about like a, a meter or so um, in length. And it's it, it was found in pieces and written in, in uh, what looked like basically Roman um, uh, alphabet, but um, it's, 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 it's used for, for the Gaulish, uh, the ancient Gauls to be able to recognize specific times of the year that were considered auspicious. So we have these pieces that are, are 
helping us to kind of understand where uh, some of the earlier forms of Samhain was actually celebrated, which is that, that herald of the dark period of the year that's coming in. Um, over the course of uh, some of the celebrations that took place six months before um, and even uh, around May 1st, we actually have that the, um, presence of recognizing the, the, the reapings that will come in through harvests. So you collect all the food, all the, 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 the sustenance you'll need to be able to survive over the course of the winter. And so you'll celebrate through feasts and you'll have these wonderful fires, which is the one that we're seeing behind, um, behind you, Laura. <laughs> So in their, their earlier forms, the way that the bonfires were actually used um, uh, in Irish, there is actually the term tina knav, um, which is actually the, the, the bone fires. So bones were actually used to put into the fires, not just wood itself. Um, and there is a functional aspect that's behind it. As um, Ambassador McKee mentioned, there's a very symbolic uh, nature to fire, to bringing light, because you're entering that period of darkness, you want to be able to hope for the light coming back. Uh, there's a purification aspect that comes with fire as well. Um, but what's really important too, and it's, it's, it's what's left from the fire. So you'll be having a, a bonfire at a very sacred space. Um, some of those spaces that are found in Ireland today that are gathering spaces as well for a lot of neo-pagans too, who want to celebrate ha uh, Halloween. Um, Tlachta, which is kind of one of the, the epicenters where you would have these, these fires that would be lit. And people would use those fires and bring them back home uh, as means of, of kind of blessing their hearth for the new year that, that is to come. So in the bones that are used and everything that kind of turns into ash, the functional aspect, you would use that ash and then afterwards you go and spread it onto uh, your lands to make it fertile. And just as a little parallel on fertilization, there is a very, very strong link with mythological deities that are invoked during these specific periods in the year. Um, the Morigan, who is this triplicity goddess who has the forms as she shapeshifts into a crow. Uh, she has a, um, these very um, important qualities that are tied to, to wars and to battles, to inciting people into wars. She can be seen as washing as well. Um, uh, blood off uh, of, of her, her clothing and can be seen as a bad omen. But all these elements that are tied to these particular deities are, again, a symbol of that death to bring forward a rebirth and to bring fertility back so that you have a continuity and uh, uh, basically a thread that will continue on for generations to come. Great, thank you. And the bone fire thing is very interesting. I actually only learned about that myself watching The Haunting of Bly Manor a few weeks ago when that came out because they have a whole episode talking about throwing the bones in the fire and the sort of purification elements that you said to sort of cleanse yourself of, you know, painful memories and so on. So yeah, no, that was really interesting. Um, so the sound fires then, is that what would have given rise to our bonfires today that some people light on Halloween? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and actually the interesting bit too that's that's tied into those fires, you wouldn't have them just around Samhain. So um, if you do, and, and we talked about it on Tuesday, if you split basically the year uh, with uh, around May 1st and then November 1st, you have these perfect uh, um, hemispheres that are actually set up to then recognize with the fires those momentous periods in the year. So at the Beltane, there are fires that are actually uh, lit up as well again very much akin to fertility those that's a good moment to to do some some rituals that are around bringing birth not just to land but also for 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 people themselves those are very good times to actually become pregnant so if women want to become pregnant they will do specific uh, fertility rituals then and um people might not necessarily see the link of it but Samhain also has a very important uh role to 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 bring fertility because there is uh, this notion of rebirth that's going to come back. And so if you're, you've already reaped a lot of foods and you have that sustenance for winter, it's, it's a good time to become pregnant because you know that you'll be able to have a child that will thrive throughout the pregnancy and then lead to that birth in the, the other um, cycle. Um, so these fires do hold that, those specific symbolic rites and um, the embers themselves as well. Um, a lot of stories are tied to them. Uh, they can be associated to a little bit you know, gloomier aspects or scary aspects, which has to do with the devil. 
Um, and so, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to talk right now about the jack-o'-lantern and the stories that are tied to the jack-o'-lantern. You may as but... well go for it. It's all relevant <laughs> if you're putting the into return of gophers. So, um, so these are more recent stories, but the idea of fire as bringing back that ember at home and lighting what, what used to be a jack-o'-lantern was actually a turnip in Ireland. So it's harder to carve than a pumpkin, which is now something of a staple now in Halloween, mostly because it is a native food here in North America. Um, and it was the Irish immigrants who arrived here who found these and were delighted to kind of change that tradition from turnips to gourds. Um, but essentially any root vegetable like turnips and beets as well were used and carved and in it you would put um, um, candles, you would fire basically to attract the good souls that had departed during the year and, and um, pay tribute to those who had left in your family and so on. But also at the same time, the way that they were carved were supposed to trick the bad spirits away. And some of the stories that are tied to the jack-o'-lantern that we have is Stingy Jack in particular, who managed to trick the devil. And tricking the devil is actually a continental European thread. It's, it's seen a little bit everywhere around the world. And we certainly see, see a lot of it as well here in Canada with the immigrants who arrived and brought their stories with them. And certainly from a post-Christian context, um, when you have the devil that interacts, who tries to um, negotiate and barter the soul of a, a person, and then the, the, the person managed to dupe, to dupe the, the devil, in which case, does Jack, this is exactly what he did, um, in trying to negotiate more time so that he wouldn't die, he actually tricks the devil into turning into a coin to buy some ale before he goes on, but then he decides not to pay with that particular coin, puts it in his pocket next to, um, it's normally a religious talisman, so be a cross or something that had been blessed, and it prevents the devil from taking his form and claiming his soul, and then he goes through a process of continuously tricking the devil, and uh, eventually, when he is at the point where he has to, to, to die, he's refused entry in heaven because he says he's not been a very good person. <laughs> and the devil then turns around and says, oh, well, I can't claim you because you actually tricked me into not being able to bring you back to hell. So he's doomed forever to actually walk the lands with his jack-o'-lantern, his turnip or his pumpkin. Um, with the, uh, the, the light that shines and uh, basically is kind of like a carrier of souls in a sense when you think about it. And these are, these are beliefs that were actually, um, again, pan-Celtic, where you would have a, a, a supernatural death messenger or carrier that would bring you to the other world. Um, for the Bretons, he actually looks a lot like the, um, they're, they're gendered, so he looks a lot like uh, the Grim Reaper in a skeletal function with a felt hat and a scythe to collect the souls. Um, and whereas in Ireland, the supernatural death messenger is one of the favorite characters that both you and Ambassador McKee, like the Banshee, <laughs> would come and, and basically- Life is a very strong word. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't claim the souls, but what she, what she does do is she screeches and she laments in a way that is very different from the Keening women, the lamenters of the dead. That was a long, long-standing tradition in Ireland. Um, and you could hear her screeches from far away, but it was again, just specific people and families that were able to hear the, the scream of the Banshee and their duty was to tell somebody in the family about the passing of someone in their family. So all of these, these elements are kind of tied in and they're, they, they become very powerful at this time of year because it is that liminal time where we have the veil between the worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead that is very, very thin and it becomes a very magical and supernaturally charged time. Mm -hmm. No, that definitely, that makes a lot of sense. But um, the, the amount of stories you hear from various different countries about people tricking the devil, it sounds like it's quite an easy thing to do with the amount of stories going around. Um, but same, like just to kind of echo what the ambassador said, for anybody watching that hasn't seen Derby of Gilman Little People, if you go onto YouTube after this, just look up Derby and Little People, Banshee. I mean, it's it's just a light show on a cliff face, but when you're five, it just guarantees you won't sleep for a year thinking about this Banshee that's going to turn up to your house and kill you or whatever her role was in that movie. <laughs> um, it's very, very scary. And also there's a headless horseman actually in that same scene. 
So that could be where some of that came into um, Irish culture. Like I'm actually thinking about a question that was asked on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it is. It's it's very interesting how these things get into the sort of popular culture through film or through tales passed down over the generations and how it all kind of morphs into what it becomes today. Um, so just to follow up there, what you said about the veil between the two worlds um, being thinner at this time of year, I think that leads us nicely into talking about the other world mm-hmm. um, and the sort of passage between the two. And I suppose, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the, the puka and the good people and everything over the last while. And from certainly my own Twitter feed, every few months, somebody shares their own news story of, oh, you know, my dad was in a field and he got lost. We so turned his jacket inside out so he could leave and um, different stories like that. And you saw in the new movie about the Eurovision, the elves in Iceland, which I think got people talking about that again. So would you be able to speak to that a little bit in your experience and what you've learned about the, the puka, the elves, the other, like the good, the good people in the other world, please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as the other world is concerned, there's um, just for folks that might make a bit of a confusion with the underworld, it's, it's different. So while we do have the fires that are blazing and that might actually make a reference to hell, when we talk about the other world, it is not, it's not hell, it's not heaven. It's, it's this other plane altogether that has uh, basically supernatural beings that live in it, but in which humans can potentially enter. Um, they can do it by mistake, which is those famous knolls or places where they step on. And this is where you get the belief where you have to be careful, where you actually go and venture. Um, but there are also, also a, a large companion of stories that are actually tied to uh, heroes in Ireland who have been lured by fairies to go to the other world and to even potentially engage in relations with uh, a fairy, um, fairy queen of sorts, um, and then have to come back to the other to the real world. And when they do, the time that's spent in the other world is completely different than what we have in the real world. So where you'd be probably feasting and having fun with fairies for what you think might be a few hours actually turns out to be a year or maybe three years when you do enter back into the real world. So with a lot of the stories that have been told about the other world, it was it was mostly based on these cautionary narratives on what could be the potential issues that happens when you venture into a place that you don't know or when you encounter as well potential invaders. We do know that in Ireland, there's a lot of invasions that were happening. Um, I like the fact that you're actually making the link to with Scandinavians and <laughs> there, there were a lot of Viking invasions that were happening in Ireland. So there, there's a, um, a lot of borings that are happening as far as trying to tell these stories in a sense that is very much in a, a cautionary sense that there, there can be people from outside of the island that arrive and to caution those particular interactions. But at the same time, that belief function, especially one that could be based more on mythology, is, is, is more tied to those stories that we have with those fairies and those that, that can potentially bestow a gift, but also can be tricksters in their own right. And we see that with the puka, who is a trickster um, and a character that kind of looks like a cross between a bunny and a horse. <laughs> Um, so you have a lot of descriptions in how the puka can actually look like and the, the, that particular thread as well is something that's found in, in other uh, Celtic nations in, in Wales, for example, the Mariluid, where you would have a person who would actually disguise as, as uh, they would have a, a horse's a, a mare's um, skull with a sheet and they would go in very much like what you would do with mummers around Christmas time, knocking at doors, reciting poetry or pieces of literature, being invited in to drink and eat and then afterwards going on their merry way. The hobby horse also comes into play. So these these characters, these other world characters like the puka, um, they're they're all tied to these these otherworldly beings that would be um, both scary, but at the same time also very much tied to this the the some of the aspects that might be tied as well to sovereignty because we have a lot of courses that are also tied to sovereignty. But the idea of actually associating that particular um, um, fairy-like quality or creature trickster-like quality is something that's found across uh, across several of those Celtic nations. So you t- use the term good people and I really like that. Um, that is also a term that's used as well uh, in Ireland and the, there are stories in Ireland, uh, in, in, sorry, in Newfoundland. There are stories in Newfoundland where um, there had been some folks who had gone berry picking and um, if ever they get lost or they're afraid that they'll be taken by the fairies, they do have to also turn their coats inside out and put their pockets out. 
Um, but they might also be carrying with them specific items that are blessed. So again, bread that might have been blessed before, then, then they'll be they'll be leaving breadcrumbs to kind of ward off the the, the bad fairies. Um, but those stories are in essentially the same types of roots for the abduction narratives that you would have, which would again serve as caution for folks who might potentially be um, lured by folks who don't necessarily have good intentions and then things that happen and it's the trauma and trying to um, uh, deal with that trauma and explaining it in a way that seems a little bit more ephemeral. <laughs> so those are some of the stories that can kind of be tied in and, and be brought in. But you, yeah, you definitely do not want to be taken by the fairies because then bad stuff can be happening. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't sound like the most fun you could ever have. And <laughs> what I find so fascinating about Irish culture, especially kind of growing up in the west of Ireland, is that, you know, everybody has these beliefs about the fairies, but nobody talks about it, but everybody does talk about it, but not in any sort of real way. Because, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, I don't believe in fairies, but you won't go stand in that fort in your uncle's field. You will greet a hawthorn tree. They will redirect an entire motorway to go around a fairy tree in case they offend the fairy people. Um, so I just think that's a really interesting part of Irish culture that we all low key believe in something, but also won't admit to it. Um, and I just think that's really interesting because it kind of comes up in different places like in Newfoundland and the Elves and Iceland and everything else or these things that everyone kind of on one level is like, we must respect this. But in the other level, you're like, like, you know, I don't believe that at all. So it's, it's just it's, I find that really interesting. Um, and then I suppose, you know, the different depictions of all this in contemporary horror movies and thrillers mm -hmm. and everything else is also very interesting and um, is there any sort of particularly good examples you might be able to direct people to well any any story that has these ghoulies and goblins that come in and also ghosts and uh, certainly when we look at that that fairies themselves and here there is a, in North America a lot of people do have these wonderful ghost stories where people want to talk about the hauntings and uh, things that can happen from these hauntings but uh, essentially they're 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 tied to the same types of trickery that some of the, fa the fairies can do like if you see some things that shift around in your house um, where folks in uh, let's say 200 years ago in Ireland would have said it was you know a bad fairy that came in that took took something and shifted it around it could also be associated to ghosts as well so there are links to be made with those particular supernatural um, events and I, I like the fact too that you kind of mentioned how people talk about these things but there's also a little bit of a stigma that's tied to it where you know who 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 actually does believe in this and what happens and there's always going to be something that's unexplainable to a certain degree and and that supernatural and anything that is that is not explainable on the natural realm that is very eerie and occult um it, it does bring in a little bit of fear because people do like to have a sense that they're able to control and understand things that are in their natural environment and fairies completely destabilize that and so at the root of it, it's the same essence that we get even in contemporary horror films where we have a, an embodiment, whether it is a, a, an exorcism that's happening, a poltergeist of sorts, or you have these ghostly apparitions, they serve the same type of function, which is completely to destabilize um, what we're, we're used to. And that they're happening at a specific time of year it's again out of respect for that that you kind of have to res do specific rituals and, and enact customs to be able to appease the fairies in the same way that you would have done also for for deities um and especially with the the druids two thousand years ago it would have been the same same function to you would worship at a specific time and pay tribute and hopefully hope for the best that you wouldn't be tricked too much by uh the bad tricksters Great. I'd like to follow up on a couple of things you talked about in the event we had on Tuesday, particularly around the sort of idea of divination and mischief making and um, the sort of things that then came out as that, like trick or treating, costumes, masks, all that kind of stuff. So would you mind just, I suppose, giving us a little bit of background about that and kind of how it morphed into what we have today? Yeah, so the divination has been around for quite a while. The types of, of, um, of amusements as well that have been done, not just in Ireland, in Scotland and Wales as well, just to, to be able to um, um, use this particular liminal time as a way to, to have um, clairvoyance or fortune telling of sorts. So there would be specific items of 
importance of few of the future, like the barn brack, for example, that you would have some items in it. And as you're serving the barn brack, if you end up getting a coin, it means that you would be wealthy. If you found a ring, it meant that you would be married within the year. A piece of rag would mean that you would you would uh, be challenged financially. Um, and then there'd be some other items that have eventually kind of left the the, uh, the, the realm of the barn brack that were a little bit negative as far as relationships were concerned. But um, people can put in other types of elements in their 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 importance of future in those foodstuffs. And coal cannon was also used as one of particular food staples to put these items in and people would, would discover them. Um, but then you would have as well other types of, of uh, enactments like looking into a mirror and trying to basically invoke what would be potentially your spouse. And these were, were depicted in 19th century postcards. I mean, we'd look them on Tuesday, um, but that was one of the elements that was actually brought into North America from both Ireland and Scotland were these particular divination rituals that were done. Um, other games like the bobbing for apples, it's a, it's, it's a nod to the, the apples themselves being a fruit of the fall, which you would uh, have plenty. And then again, as you're entering your, your, your winter period to, to, to be able to, to continue surviving, you'd want to have foodstuffs that are actually made with these particular fruits and nuts and so on. So using those particular staple food items was a way to, to, to again, kind of wish for the best. <laughs> um, and then you'd have these, these other types of divinations that would be done as well um, with the foodstuffs, like throwing the peels of apple over your shoulder and then whatever shape it takes, it looks the, 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 the letter itself would be potentially the spouse that you would be with. So a lot of these are tied to, again, people coming together, um, but those merriments were um, moments where communities did actually assemble together and were able to, to, uh, to celebrate. Uh, so it, it's, while you can have um, an individual that can celebrate Samhain, it's actually something that is better celebrated in groups. And this is where you would have the merriment that comes in for sure. I thought the um, picture of the person looking in the mirror to see like who would be their future spouse is that, um, and just kind of made me think, is that what kind of gave rise to the whole, if you look in the mirror and say, Bloody Mary three times, she will appear, or, you know, all these other things of why people don't want to look in the mirror and say certain things, <laughs> or they do, depending on how they are inclined. Did that kind of come out of that, do you think? There are, yes, there are definite parallels that are tied to it. Um, the, the scary part of that divination ritual is that if you saw a skull, it actually meant that you were going to die within the year. So again, those particular beliefs, um, they've been rehashed through different types of, of customs over time. And we certainly see a lot of traditions, especially with teenagers, where there's this, it's, it's a stension, right? It's just wanting to reenact specific stories that you've heard uh, with the hopes that something like that will happen. But at the same time, you're, you're fearful that it actually will, but you're, you're, you're really, you're like, you're, you're playfully trying to, to see if it's really going to happen. So yeah, <laughs> those I are the kind of bits that come in with Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and there is, yeah, the mischief making that comes in is, is, uh, is, is part of it as well. And, and so you would have people that would play those types of tricks too, and would scare folks. So the guising and disguising, it really comes into play as well. So just to come back to the barn brack thing, so people that are watching, if you keep an eye on our Twitter feed over the next couple of days, we'll be sharing some resources from Tourism Ireland, who have done a really great video on the sort of fortune telling of a barn brack. Like when I was a kid, there was just a ring in it, like, yeah, you're going to get married. But apparently way back when there would be sticks to say, sorry, you're going to be single forever. You know, just very depressing cake. <laughs> so I prefer it now that it's just a ring that you'll get married and or break your tooth at the same time. Um, so I'm wondering, could you tell us a bit about um, modern sound in Ireland? Because the ambassador alluded in his opening remarks where like the Irish immigrants took the turnips with them, you know, only found pumpkins or the carbon pumpkins that came back to Ireland, sort of the souling became coming trick-or-treating and you know we are wearing a mask to ward off evil spirits became the modern day Halloween costume etc can you give us a bit more background about how it was exported and then imported back into Ireland so uh, I talked a little bit about the mummering aspect but there's uh, the mummer is also um, celebrated in uh, in Ireland and that came also to, to uh, North America so the idea of actually guising and and wearing masks 
that came here and then would have come gone back. There's two separate things that are happening. One is is the return back to the traditions of actually the the wizards, which is closer to the types of masks that would have been worn about a hundred years ago. So things that that are more homemade um, to a certain degree too, that look a little bit like the the, the Ren boys with the, the um, uh, straw hats and hiding basically your your face and confusing as well the the, the ghoulies and the goblins and so on. Um, but you also have, um, at the same instance, the commercialization of Halloween, which is completely different in the sense that you didn't, you don't necessarily have people who disguise with the same traditional outfits as they might have, which looks more like, as I mentioned, the mummers and so on. But now it takes more of the form of, you know, superheroes, not necessarily things that might be scary. Um, we've certainly opened the door with uh, some of the the costumes that might be a little bit ose. <laughs> Um, but those 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 types of, of performances that are done um, have kind of shifted because of that commercialization aspect. Um, but you still have those two elements that are happening in Ireland. And I, actually, I do want to kind of mention a, a really interesting site to go and visit. Uh, so um, hats off to Michael Fortune, who's actually a field uh, worker. He's done a lot of interviews with uh, several folks across Ireland. Um, and uh, if you go on folklore.ie, you'll be able to see some of those interviews that he talks about wizards and colics as well, which is actually the term that's taken from the kylix, which is the hag. Um, so just to a certain degree, you stretch it out to, to witches. Um, but um, it, these are, are one aspect of, of, the, of the more traditional forms that are, are being enacted. And then on the flip side, you have the more, um, to a certain degree, Americanized version of a Halloween, which is more packaged through this slew of types of costumes that you can wear and almost takes on carnival form. And I remember we had to chat about the fact that it's not just Halloween day, but it might be a week of celebration or even, you know, in, in Salem, Massachusetts, I talked to, it can be over a month easily. And during the year, even people will go and will be dressed just to kind of be in the spirit of Halloween because Salem has this very potent, <laughs> potent space and very touristy for, for attracting. But but we do see the elements of performance that are tied in and people wanting to, to get out of their zones and into a, a recognition of what they could be in an alternate way and then uh, go back to, to normal the next day. So um, these are elements that have been brought back again to, uh, to Ireland and are, are repackaged through that model. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because it's the, I suppose it all ties in as well to the commercialization aspect that you mentioned there, because when we were kids, you'd get a black sack to put over your head and you get another black sack and that was your cape. And then if you were lucky, you'd get like a, a one pound mask from the pound store and that was your Halloween costume, right? You go like it was a plastic bag, <laughs> very bad for the environment, go out and gather your sweets. Um, but now, especially we'll say in the States, every time a building is vacant or a store closes down, you blink and suddenly it's a spirit of Halloween store. And I mean, like, I'm not knocking the costumes in there are unbelievable, but, um, you know, there's definitely that element to it now where you have to get your bigger and better costumes and everybody else. And it's a big industry. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's quite irritating when you hear people think of it as just a commercial aspect. Like there's a line in Hocus Pocus where... Uh, this guy has just moved to Salem from California and he's like oh you know like Halloween's a made-up thing by the candy companies <laughs> you know and people don't realize that it's actually like from an ancient festival and that's what we're celebrating at the core of the whole thing and um, do you want to speak a little bit more to the commercialization aspect? Yeah actually it, it's interesting too that we're talking about that let's trick-or-treating with the candies and so on if you have um, just looking at the candies that we have now obviously it's it's not the same thing that you would have had over a thousand years ago. Um, but the food stuff that I mentioned with the fruits and the nuts, those were the types of things that were actually given when folks would do the souling at the doors and then they would ask as well for, for payment. So they'd be given coins. Um, and that was also something that was done to even here in Canada. I remember as a child, I was actually going door to door and if they didn't have candy, they had pennies to give to UNICEF. So that was a major thing for us. Um, but essentially, yeah, you, you, you have, you have an industry that does kind of focus on, on what can be marketable from Halloween, but at the root of it, what we're doing and how we're enacting it, it's, 
it really is something that's tied to recognizing the fact that we're entering a dark period and we're really focusing on the northern hemisphere here we're entering a dark period of the year and this is this is a, a way to kind of appease the er the early gods and the fairies and so on to kind of you know move on to that next step so the candy kind of comes in through that element as, as one of the foodstuffs the disguising comes in through the other as well and um and we have this trick-or-treating and merriment no, I think uh, the sort of week long festivals you mentioned there are also fascinating. Like I was at I was at Sleepy Hollow last year, and um, oh. which was amazing. All the street signs of like your headless horseman on it, and mm -hmm. and we couldn't get parking anywhere, so we just ended up doing a circle and moved on because there was hundreds of people queuing to get into the graveyard to go to Ichabod Crane's grave because that myth is so you know pervasive not only in Sleepy Hollow but everywhere and people come from all over and same with Salem that was on the list for this year thanks COVID and um, <laughs> <laughs> we are one of those people like that are, just want to see all of it but they've actually started and it's amazing a puka festival in Ireland mm -hmm. which when we are allowed to travel again and um, you know would highly recommend people go to but actually Tourism Ireland again our friends and colleagues over there I put a lot of the people stuff online this year. So I'd highly recommend going on to Ireland.com at some point and just checking out what you can see virtually. I know it's not the same, but it will do us all for now. And then hopefully we'll be able to, to travel again soon. Um, I was looking at my phone there because people, sometimes people also comment that way. So um, people are saying that their parents used to wrap money in the call cannon as well. Like not just in, yeah, yeah, not just in your burn brack. Uh, That's the mashed yeah. potatoes with cabbage. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what Kalkanen is, it's actually kind of tasty. I really like it. I enjoy it. But yes, yeah. <laughs> cabbage is an acquired taste, Julie. So. <laughs> <laughs> the chat is actually very quiet tonight, guys. So everyone that's watching, feel free to throw in your, your comments and questions there. Um, I actually, suppose we're waiting. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to open up to as well. I just um, uh, um, I had talked about Michael Fortune as well, his work, but I, I just want to mention very quickly, um, for those of you who are interested in actually knowing more about these earlier um, um, religious movements and how they are today and neo-paganism, um, there is a, a, Dr. Jenny Butler, who's a folklorist at UCC. She's done extensive research on that. And she, there's actually quite a few videos of her online, but I definitely recommend folks to, to look her up. Um, and uh, as a folklorist as well, she looks at, at everything, same things that I've been looking at as well and, and talking about. Um, but there is a resurgence of that, that popular movement of neo-paganism. And they do gather, as I mentioned, that, these sites that are were considered sacred thousands of years ago and are coming back uh, through that form and people are celebrating it in a very modern way um, but again kind of paying tribute to what 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 these sites were used for initially as gathering grounds and and recognition of that sacred space and mm -hmm. um, I'll just ask a question there before the the chat gets going here hopefully so in terms of somebody wants to dress up as something that isn't a sexy ghost or whatever else they can, they can buy on Amazon these days, baffling, and your sort of your traditional costumes, I don't mean your original, original ones where I assume it was just sort of your sack thought to hide your identity and things, but your more traditional costumes, and I suppose you'd be looking even before the vampire myth of Bram Stoker, like back then, like what would, if somebody wants to do an authentic costume, what would you recommend they wore? Um, if they wanted to do something authentic as in like a thousand years ago or so. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Robes and a, and a handmade mask. <laughs> but I like the fact that you mentioned uh, that Dracula and also Bram Stoker as, as uh, the ambassador of McKee had mentioned um, the, the story of Dracula. I mean, it's, it's a great parallel as well to all things that I spoke about the idea of invasions of unknown and people coming from elsewhere and what it means. And certainly Dracula has that embodiment, but also just as a succubus himself. And, and we talked about Puka and um, the element of what it, what it was is a, almost like a, a trickster. Um, there's a, the, there's a lot of narratives around the devil taking the shape of a horse, but in certain parts of the world, and if you see it and certainly in, 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 uh, in America as well, the, the legend of the Chupacabra, who actually sucks blood, <laughs> the vampiric beast. 
um, the way that they actually describe it, when you kind of extrapolate how some of those stories are, are tied in and being fearful of these supernatural creatures, um, they, they've always kind of roamed in the imagination. So these literary bodies are amazing, amazing places to go and get those, 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 those nuggets to, to help inspire you if you want to find different types of ways to, to get dressed up. For sure. And I think like Dracula when I was a teenager reading was one of the most terrifying things. I, I read it when I was 12, I think, and I was low-key convinced Dracula was going to come to my house and like eat me or something. Um, <laughs> because it's such a well-written book. It just, you know, has that perfect pacing of dread. But um, I think the older Halloween movies that don't have sort of a such a focus on the sort of guts and gore and stuff, but just take it back to the very basic Nosferatu. Is made mm-hmm. in the 1920s, one of the scariest films you will ever see. And it's so simple. It's just Max Streff wandering around like this, like <laughs> fighting people, you know? Um, so I think those are also very good inspirations for scary costumes. Just take it back to the basics. So, yeah, no, I love what you just said there. I have a question here. Um, are there any links between Halloween and St. Bridget's Day? Uh, or, you know, the goddess Bridget, of course, at the beginning. Yeah, so Embolic is actually another feast uh, time of the year. It's around February 1st and 2nd. Normally these feast days can last several days. So um, there is a tie with St. Bridget, but also with Bridget, uh, the uh, the deity, the, the goddess. So um, fires are very important because it is at that moment where again, you're bringing back light. So you're recognizing life that's coming back. It's also a time of year where you start seeing um, livestock having um, their, their, their young. So um, that life, that promise of life is, is being uh, recognized as well. Um, and certainly with St. Bridget's with the fire at uh, Kildare, um, there were fires that were apparently burning for 500 years and no man could approach them. It was only women that were allowed to be next to them. So as fire keepers, women that were there, that kind of shows as well some of the ties that are, that are very important to um, specific gender roles too. Um, for, for carrying out these rituals. Great, mm-hmm. thank you. Um, another great question here. Do you know of other celebrations and cultures around the world that are similar to Halloween or historically is it a unique celebration? Oh, absolutely. Well, Dio de los Muertos for um, uh, in, in Latin America, we have a lot of uh, similarities as well with um, still today, it's the Toussaint in France. So it would be the celebration of the dead close to November, uh, it's November 1st. Um, it takes on more of a religious uh, context, though. And there's other parts as well. Uh, I think we had some folks that were mentioning uh, the recognition of those that departed as well. Um, uh, at, at a later time, though, that's not necessarily with the same date, um, depending on where you are. Again, I'm really focusing on the Northern Hemisphere part, but what's what's really um, fascinating is that with most cultures around the world, you do want to at least acknowledge those that have departed, and whether you celebrate them through feast days or if you do specific rituals or other types of enactments, those are a part of, it's not just the individual, it is a collective um, importance. Mm-hmm. And actually, the St. Bridget's question just made me think of something there. So I think the ambassador kind of alluded to this in his remarks as well, is that, you know, they weren't able to Christianize Halloween, like All Hallows Eve, Samhain, etc. Whereas with the goddess Bridget, she was then sort of pulled into Christianity as St. Bridget. And I'm wondering, would you have any, um, would you have any sort of insights as to why maybe they couldn't do the same with Halloween? I know we've got All, All Souls Day, I think, on the 1st of November. Which is, yeah, yeah. yeah. It didn't seem to capture Halloween, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. No, so all saints. It, it kind of it kind of does go into you know what's what's the realm of acceptable in Christianity, but um, then after we go back to all souls the next day, which is again the souls of the departed, and then you start doing customs that are not seen as being. Uh, Christian at all um, so it's 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 as if it kind of it inserted itself but it, it did it in a way that was not necessarily changing the whole atmosphere of it so we do have this perfect you know I, um, notion of of this pre pre-christian pagan past that's still very very prevalent at that time of year um, and um, those those fires I think are still going to continue burning until the end of time <laughs> And then um, would you see, are there any links between, I'm sorry, I figured out how to ask this. Um, so, you know, the way in Salem, obviously the witch trials and all that was a very puritanical outlook on life and things. And that 
you know, these women that are being accused of witchcraft, probably zero of them were actually practicing witchcraft or, you know, Wiccan or anything, anything remotely resembling, you know, what they would have seen as witchcraft. Do you think any of the fears that they had came from these ancient Celtic uh, festivals like the Druids and Sion and everything else? No, the, the fears actually that were stem, uh, they actually came from um, Tituba, which was, uh, she, she was a slave that came from the West Indies and she brought more of the, the voodoo um, um, practices. And it kind of went awry. And it's again, what would have been practiced and what actually was recorded is a little bit uh, shady, but ultimately the hysteria that came from it um, is an example of what happens when you suppress <laughs> and you're not able to actually express or perform mm -hmm. um, and it was a, a detachment from what was happening you know those that had left England basically because they weren't being as pure to their beliefs and then arriving to uh, New England established this new new form of, of living which really did not want to recognize any of that so anything that would have been seen as remotely um, pagan of sorts was seen as a big no-no mm. um, and yes there were there were prosecutions that occurred in executions for supernatural deeds which did not really happen and were again tied into mass hysteria and ultimately at the root of it when you kind of go back to it and it's, it's a nice little segue into that particular commercialization aspect we were looking at people were also driven economically for accusing other folks because they saw potential land that they could actually grab from having people removed <laughs> So again, those those are, are some of the the, the fear things, the fearful things that can come in again to 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 scare you <laughs> around around Halloween time. You know, think okay, I don't want to be dispossessed of my lands and my goods. <laughs> I stop being a witch for a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just I'm trying to think. Then the can you tell us a little bit more about the idea of souling. Mm -hmm. I wrote it down to ask you and I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so the souling would happen around the, the old uh, souls day. So you would actually go around houses and, as I mentioned before, collect fruits, nuts to, to pray for the souls of those that had departed. So it was a form of payment that was done to those that collected. And then they would go to the church and then they would they would pray. So it was very much tied to, to, um, to uh, Christianity on that level. Uh, but then other things were also being performed. Like I mentioned the Rem boys earlier, there's this, this notion of potentially collecting money that is not necessarily for souls, but more for the funeral of the Ren that they, they allegorically kill. <laughs> it can get very dark very quickly. <laughs> and there's a lot of stories that are tied to it. It's, it's entrenched in treachery and so on. But, but essentially you have reenactments that are done to, to kind of acknowledge that. And there's always a collection of foods or, or, or money that comes in. And the souling aspect was to pray for the souls of the departed. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, we seem to have a very uh, shy group of viewers today uh, in a change from Tuesday, so there's not too many questions coming in, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, I think I'll give it another minute, but otherwise this has been absolutely fascinating. Like I, I, when we started applying for Halloween, the first thing I did was call you and I was like, you were brilliant last year. I really want to do a deeper dive. I think we gave you 15 minutes last year um, and I just knew that you had so much more to tell us and we had so much more we could learn from you. So um, I just really wanted to bring you back this year. And this has been everything I hoped and more. So thank you so much for giving your time to join us tonight and for imparting all of this Halloween wisdom as we proceed with reclaiming this very important um, Irish festival. So yeah, I think, um, oh, sorry, we have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Did Halloween allow women to take on any kind of special roles that would have been out of the ordinary or day to day? If you're associating it with the recognition of the departed, of those that had left, then yes, women would have held a, a role. In Ireland, it didn't necessarily look the same as, for example, what you would have in Brittany, where there would be specific moments in the, in the year where um, women, especially off the coast of Brittany and the islands of West Island, say, would actually perform um, what was called a poela, which was bringing back souls. Um, the, the, the deceased that were at sea, they didn't have bodies for them. So they had to recognize the death, the departed. So there might've been some similar things as well that were tied to women in Ireland and recognizing those that were, were deceased, but yeah. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very, very much for this. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back again next year to teach us even more things. 
Um, so yeah, just thanks a million. And thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. Um, we will, this video will be live on our YouTube channel to watch again later, or share with your friends. Um, and just keep an eye on our social media channels over the next few days to, we have uh, some resources we'll be sharing, like facts about Ireland is the home of Halloween. We'll be sharing videos. Our colleagues in Tourism Ireland have, off, have also done a great body of work on this. So for the next few days, you'll see a lot about like hashtag Ireland, the home of Halloween. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye on that. And yeah, so thank you all. And we'll see you again soon. I'm going to, bye bye everyone. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.